past eight years, but I work at the national level, so I, I go all across the country. Uh, Arizona is one of the top three states for school choice, and we really are a pioneer. We were the first state to adopt tax credit scholarships. Uh, we were the first state to adopt education savings accounts. There are now 18 states that have tax credit scholarships. There are five states that have education savings accounts and lots that are looking at them right now. So uh, people really around the country do look to Arizona when it comes to uh, educational choice. So the options that we have, uh, first of all, open enrollment. Uh, a lot of states don't even have this, where you can go to a traditional public school that you are not zoned to. Uh, and we'll get into some of the numbers in a minute. Uh, charter schools, tax credit scholarships, and of course, the empowerment scholarship accounts or education savings accounts, ESAs. And I'll get into some of these. Uh, ESAs are probably the least understood, okay? Uh, these are restricted use bank accounts parents can use for a wide variety of approved educational expenses or to save for future expenses. Uh, so how this works, uh, and Mary pointed out, our public ed funding comes from three sources, uh, federal, state, and local. Uh, this doesn't touch any federal funds, doesn't touch any local funds. Those stay with the local public schools. What the ESA does is it allows 90% of the state funding to follow the child. Uh, and unlike a traditional voucher or even a tax credit scholarship, it can follow the child to a wide variety of options. Not just private school tuition, that's one option, but also things like tutoring, textbooks, online learning, educational therapy, uh, and if you have anything left in your account at the end of the year, you can roll it over to the next year so that parents have an incentive to save, to economize. Uh, you can't see it, but these are all of the different states that uh, now have, it. oh sorry, these, these are all the programs that we have. You can see participation varies. Uh, the, we don't really know how many students are receiving tax credit scholarships because they can receive from multiple programs. So we know how many are in each program. There's one that everyone's eligible for. There's one that only low-income families are eligible for. Another that only students with special needs are eligible for. And then the last one, you're eligible if you're a switcher. If you were in a public school and switched to a private school or if you were starting school for the first time. Uh, but what we do know is that there are about 7,000 students in Arizona that are using ESAs uh, and at least uh, 32,000 students that are using uh, tax credit scholarships. This is an interesting uh, slide. So this actually comes from the Arizona Charter Schools Association. It's a few years old. Uh, but what they looked at was uh, in Maricopa County, which is about 60% of the state, uh, how many families were using uh, district open enrollment policies and how many were in charter schools. And so you can see that 16% were in charter schools. It's now actually about 19% that are using charter schools statewide. Uh, and district open enrollment was 31%, which means when you add those two up, uh, in that year it was 47%, it's probably now uh, 50 or higher. When you throw in all the families that are going to private school or they're using the ESA or that are homeschooling, we have north of 50%, at least in Maricopa County and, and likely statewide, more than 50% of children are in a learning environment other than their assigned district school. We have the highest rate of choice in education in the country. Wow. And what has that gotten us? Uh, so you can see this is charter school enrollment. 2011, there were over 120,000 students. By 2017, you had 185,000 students statewide that were using it. It's, it's even higher today. Uh, and look, this is around the country. Okay, the darker it is, the the, the um, this is from the, I should say this is from the Brookings, and this is access to a local charter school. They define access as, as if there is a charter school in your zip code. 84% of children in Arizona have a charter school in their zip code, the highest in the country, highest access in the entire country to charters. And, and you look at the usage, uh, this is a couple years ago, that it was 18%. Uh, Again, highest rate of use in the country. Now, open enrollment. This is Ohio, okay? Uh, this uh, light color, I didn't make this chart, <laughs> otherwise I would use different colors. But this light color blue uh, or green is uh, open enrollment for any district. Now in that, in that state, you can do, schools can, school districts can opt to 
to have open enrollment, or they can opt to only have open enrollment from neighboring districts, or they can opt not to take students. And what you see is that there are a number that say we only take from the adjacent district. Most of them say we take from anywhere. But there are these little donuts here and here, right, where they have no open enrollment. Now, can anyone guess what those donuts are? Where those donuts are? This is called Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, Cleveland, <laughs> Akron, Canton, and Youngstown, right? In other words, there you have a city, and then all the suburbs around the city say, uh-uh, your, your kids aren't coming here. We moved out of the city for a reason. Your kids aren't coming here. There's Arizona. So green for Arizona, that's where they have open enrollment. <laughs> uh, right. So what, what does this mean? When you have all this choice, and you have students that are taking a tax credit scholarship, or you have the students that are taking an ESA or going to a charter school, and the district schools had planned on having more students, but some of those students are leaving, the district schools have space. But they can fill that space with students from other districts. So you might not be able to afford to live in Scottsdale, but you can go to Scottsdale Unified, even if you're living in North Phoenix or Central Phoenix, you can't afford to live there, but you can send their kids there, and they'll take you, right? So what that does is it actually expands opportunity, even in our district school system, for those who can't afford to live in that district. Mm. What has that done? Well, here's the AZ merit. Actually, let's look at this first. We'll zoom in, okay? Here's the district scores. This is the percent passing. 2005, 2015, 33%, right? We've moved up a little, 2018, 39%. Charter schools, you've got about 50% that are passing the AZ merit. So what we see over time is improvement in both the district and the charter sector. Charters are ahead, but the districts are also improving in response to choice and competition, in response to market forces, okay? This, it looks crazy, but I'll walk you through this. So this is the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This is the nation's report card. And these are the gains by subject, so fourth and eighth grade math, fourth and eighth grade reading, fourth and eighth grade science, by subject, okay? So this, these are the gains over that time uh, by, the, by the nation, nation's public schools. Uh, yellow is Arizona district schools. Behind that, the Arizona flag, that's the Arizona average. And in the back there, that's Arizona charters, okay? So the charters are leading the way. But the district schools are also gaining much faster than the national average, okay? Arizona charter school students are leading the country. They were second, if you took Arizona charters and you made them a state, they came in second place in eighth grade math, second place in eighth grade reading, okay? Uh, they're right up there between Massachusetts and New Hampshire. What's the difference? Okay, this was the 2015 score. Uh, so this is, uh, this is not total spending, this is what's called instructional spending, so it, it leaves out some categories of spending. Arizona, spending $7,000 per pupil. Uh, Massachusetts, um, 14,500. New Hampshire, you know, almost $14,000 per pupil. So we're spending half as much, we're getting same outcomes. Uh, one other difference, Arizona, majority minority. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, almost entirely white. Okay, so we're spending half as much, we have a much more diverse population, and we're performing, our charter sector is performing just as well as they are. Okay, again, here's the 2017 NAEP. Okay, Let's zoom in a little bit. Here's the national average. Uh, Arizona came in just under the national average this last time. Now, we used to be closer to the bottom. We've moved up significantly. We were one of the fastest moving states. Uh, in terms of improvement. We're now just under the national average, but there, <coughs> Arizona charter students in eighth grade math beat Massachusetts first place this year. And not just beat them by a little, yeah. beat them by quite a lot. Wow. Okay, so don't let anybody tell you, we're the last in the nation, we're the last in the nation. That's all you can, by the way, you can, you can cut the numbers any way you want. They're always talking about inputs, not outputs. They don't talk about outputs, they talk about spending. And of course, they don't adjust for cost of living. Because if you adjust it for cost of living, we're not at the bottom. We're in the bottom half when you, in terms of spending, but we are not at the very bottom. Uh, but 
if I told you there are two states that are performing equally as well, one spending half as much, would you say, well, the other state's better because they're spending more, right? That's crazy. But the other side controls the narrative on this. Oh, we're, we're, we're in last place because we don't spend enough. Yeah, but how are we doing? And why are we doing so well? Okay, here was us in 2002, and here was New York. This is eighth grade math in 2002. Okay, New York basically the same, and here's us. We went above New York, and now we're basically the same as New York. What's the difference? That's Arizona spending per pupil in 2015-16. There's New York, $23,000. It's all about the money. We need more money. Our schools are starving. So why isn't New York twice as good as we are? Cost of living. Okay. Yeah, cost of living is certainly part of it. You've got to adjust for that, absolutely. But don't tell awesome. me that it's all about the money. Yeah. Because it's not. Okay. Here's Arizona. And here is the Arizona Auditor General's report, something the Arizona Republic has never seen. Okay. Uh, how much do we spend per pupil in the state? I saw on the back of a whole bunch of red for ed cars, we spend $3,000 per pupil, right? Well, what they do to come up with a figure like that is they only look at the base spending from the state. We don't look at federal, we don't look at all the add-ons the state has, we don't look at local, and oh, we're only spending three grand per, per kid, but look, we're starving. No. When you take state, federal, and local, we're spending $9,929 per pupil in the last, and that was in 2018. More in 2019. Okay, so we've broken ten thousand dollars per pupil by now. Okay. Uh, so this was again uh, 20, 2018, 2019. Okay, there's Arizona district schools, there's Arizona charter schools. Wait, but I thought the Arizona charter schools got more. That's what the Arizona Republic told me. Okay, well they do get more from the state, but they don't get to tap into the local funds. So you gotta add up all the spending. The charters are getting better results with less money, okay? Arizona ESAs, if you don't look at the special ed kids, they're getting 90% of the state portion, they're getting, on average, 6,150, okay? So the Arizona ESA kids are getting a lot less. Wait, but I heard they were getting $12,000 per pupil. Yes, on average, but that's because two thirds of them are special needs. And special needs kids can get sometimes 10, 15, $20,000. Okay, uh, some kid who's blind or has autism or uh, you know spina bifida I and mean, all sorts of things, right? They're going to have uh, more more spending. But guess what? It's still 90% of the state portion, so they're still getting less per pupil than they would otherwise get. And again, 90% of the state portion, zero Fed, zero local. ESA awards cover 100% of the median private. Okay, so you hear this all the time. Oh, well, the ESA, it's not enough to cover private school tuition. Well, here's the median private elementary school tuition, about $6,000. Here's the median middle school tuition, about $6,700, so just under that. And then it's a little more than 10 grand for the median high school tuition. Uh, but at least K through eight, it's totally covered, and you gotta stretch a little when it comes to high school. So it's within reach for even a very low income family if they have the ESA, okay? Uh, you hear this too, Capital Times. Parents and voucher program, they always call it voucher. Parents and voucher program hold onto a funds. They amass large sums. I've heard this immediately, right? Maybe Cap Times is going crazy about this. Uh, some of them have uh, $100,000, okay? So what they said, dozens of families in the state school voucher program are sitting on account balances of 50 grand or more. Nine of them had $100,000 or more. Wow, what's going on here? Well, first of all, that's out of 7,000 students. Nine kids out of 7,000. So we're talking about 0.1%, uh, right? Uh, also, all of whom have very high levels of special needs. The only way, I mean, if you were a kid in this program, uh, you're getting $6,000 a year, and it was less before, it's only 6,000 now, before it was like 4,500 when the program started. You can't amass that amount of money. The only kids who are amassing that amount of money, you know, SOS is saying in the press, oh, they're saving to go to Harvard. I was speaking to a mom who had one of these high account balances. She says, my, my daughter's not going to Harvard. She's not going to college. If she graduates high school and she's reading on a fifth grade level, I will consider her to be very fortunate. Okay? They have very, very high needs. And what accounts for some of these balances? Well, some of these kids are in and out of hospitals. So when they're in the hospital and they're getting 25 grand a year, uh, they're not using their occupational therapist. And they're not using 
uh, their speech therapists and all that. So that money gets pocketed. And when that's happening year after year after year, uh, well, those account balances cannot, can run up really high. But guess what happens? Once they graduate, if there's a big balance, that all gets given back to the state. All of that money at the end goes back to the state. So if those parents are being frugal and they're being right, uh, wiser stewards of the money than the feds, or rather than the state bureaucrats, well, it's a boon to all of us. And they're still getting a better education along the way. Uh, here's the distribution of actual spending, uh, how much money these, these accounts are getting per pupil. So you can see most of them are in this 58 to 600 range, or at least the plurality. And getting more than seven grand, only a small fraction is getting more than seven grand. Okay, so that's that's the distribution. Uh, in in uh, uh, excluding kindergarten special needs, I should say. All right, do vouchers only benefit the wealthy? You hear this all the time. Oh, areas AZ Central. Vouchers are benefiting students in more affluent areas. Are they? Well, uh, the Goldwater Institute actually looked at the data. Okay, so here are the 10 school districts that have the highest concentrations of ESA students. Okay, here's the statewide child poverty rate of 19%. And here are the kids from those districts. 46, 45, 38, right? Much higher. And when you look at them, here's the district school students. These are the percent from lower poverty districts, the percent from higher poverty districts. It's basically the same. Basically the same. Right. Is more money the answer? Okay, well, uh, here's on one of the Native American reservations. That's been the news because of the bill that was uh, heard today. Okay, average GSA awards six grand. Window Rock Unified, they're spending 16,000. Statewide average, again, is 10. So they're spending 16,000. That's a 60% over the state average. 12,000, almost 16,000. 100% uh, rated DRF, 100% CDRF, more than 50% CDRF. Wow. It's the money, right? It's not the money. It's not the money. And they say, oh, well, but these kids don't have access to these schools. All right, well, uh, here is, uh, this was one of the lowest ranked school districts in the state. And you can see here are the private schools. Wow. Okay, and this is a one mile radius around those private schools. You're telling me there's no other options for these kids? There's no options for them. Okay, well, what about those? They're right there. Okay. Uh, this is the it's, so it's the Roosevelt Elementary School District, which again, uh, more than 50% of the public schools here are rated year F. Okay, they're spending $11,000. Here are the private schools: 9,700, 5,200, 5,300, 5,800, 5,300. Okay, most of them are less than what you could get with the ESA. And one of them, you know, not out of range, but still uh, tuition less per pupil in the public school spending. It's not about the money. And this was uh, from a study that I conducted several years ago. This was the first year of the ESA program, and we asked about parental satisfaction. And that year, all the participating families were had students with special needs. We had a hundred percent satisfaction rate from the ESA families. Seventy-one percent said they were very satisfied. Another 19 said that they were satisfied, 10% somewhat satisfied, uh, but 100% satisfied at some level. Uh, we asked them also about their previous public school. Okay, And you look here, only about half said that they were satisfied with their previous public school. And I, I wish I should have put up, but there's another slide. Uh, I didn't put it, but it's in the report. We actually broke it down by income the lowest income families were the least satisfied with their previous public school. They were the most likely to say they were very satisfied with the education their child was getting through the ESA. I believe it. So those families that were the most choice deprived were in schools that were serving them the least well. It was the lowest income families that had the most to gain from access to the ESA program. Uh, Another thing, uh, parents spent $700,000 in school voucher money on beauty supplies, apparel, attempted cash withdrawals, right? This is terrible, it's all fraud, right? Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, a lot of this had to do with parents whose cards were stolen. Not necessarily if the card itself was stolen, but you know, sometimes you go to a store and you swipe your card and then you get an email saying, we're sorry, 
uh, apparently uh, your credit card data has been compromised, right? So some of these people were running wild with stolen cards and they were purchasing makeup and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of the misspending was not fraud, it was parents who just, you know, they were buying paper and pens and pencils and stuff, and they didn't realize that those are not actually approved expenses. And so when they submit their receipts before they get the next quarterly disbursement, the Department of Ed says, oh, wait a second, that's not an approved expense. And so you've got to pay that back. That has to come out of your own pocket. Uh, but still, the Auditor General says they, they did an audit and they found it was only about 1% of program funds that were misspent. Again, misspending is a lot more than just fraud. A lot of it is uh, just innocent misspending. But 1%, well, less than 1%, was actually misspent. So, well, how does that compare? Well, SNAP, okay, also has about a 1% misspending rate, and the left-leaning Center on Budget and Policy Priorities calls it an effective and efficient pillar of the social safety net. What a right? double standard, huh? What about the National School Lunch Program? $800 million in misspending. Wow. The School Breakfast Program, $300 million. They have uh, misspending rates of 16 and 23 percent. We're not worried about those programs, though. Those are very important. But kids trying to get a better education outside the district school system with one percent misspending? Well, that's a scandal. That we've got to put on the front page. For real. Right. What a double standard. All right. So I'm going to wrap up. I just want to give you some uh, uh, some resources. Number one, loverschool.org, loverschool.org, loverschool.org. This is a fantastic resource. It's run by a woman named Jenny Clark. She's a special needs mom whose child uses an ESA, and she is absolutely phenomenal. She created this website, it celebrates all options, traditional public school, charter school, private school, home school, what have you. You can go on this website, you can find all sorts of amazing information about the schools and education options in your area. Um, and also they have, uh, you know, their social media accounts are constantly trying to correct these false narr narratives and put a lot of this data that I showed you out there. Uh, also, my organization, edchoice.org, uh, which I should mention, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We don't take sides uh, politically, and if the Democrats invited me to speak, I'd be happy to speak to them too. Uh, Goldwater Institute, ArizonaPolicy.org, uh, the Educational Freedom Institute, EFI.org, Federation for Children, you've probably heard of them, the American Federation of Children, AFC, uh, AC Charters, these are all great resources for you uh, if you're trying to combat uh, all that nonsense that you see out there on social media. So thank you very much. Happy to entertain questions if I have any time.